2,000 years ago, God arrived, enfleshed, Emmanuel, God with us, God in a manger. God also arrives every time a person opens their heart to Jesus. For me, when I was 15 years old, when I said yes to Jesus, God Almighty arrived. If you're a Christian, there was a time where God moved in the same way that Jesus arrived, God with us, God became the God who is with you, or if you're not yet a Christian... When you say yes to Jesus and accept his forgiveness and his death on the cross and receive the power of his resurrection, you become his child and God arrives. He moves into your life. So there's a first arrival when Jesus came on this earth. There's the arrival where he comes into our lives. But also, when we walk into this world, if you are a follower of Jesus and if Jesus lives in you, everywhere you go, he arrives with you. You walk into this world walking in the presence of Jesus with God living in you, and God shows himself to the world through the lives of people who claim the name of Jesus, who have received his grace and his forgiveness. So Jesus arrived, God with us. Jesus arrived, the Holy One, who comes into us and teaches us what holiness looks like, and we walk into the world and show holiness to the world, what it means to be set apart and different in this world. And today we're going to talk about how when Jesus arrived, truth came into the world. Jesus was the truth. Jesus is the truth. Into a world that was so confused that didn't know what truth was like it was back then as it is now, Jesus came as the truth. And when you receive Jesus, his truth moves into you and takes away all the cloudy confusion and sets you free when you walk in the truth of Jesus. And then you live in our world showing the truth of Jesus. But in our world today, people are asking this question, what is truth? I mean, what is truth? Do we even know what truth is? And and that's not surprising. It's not surprising that people are wondering and struggling. People say things like, well, my truth is this. My truth? I get to make up my own truth? No, no. But, But it's not surprising because in our world, we have all these things coming our way that are confusing, that don't feel really very truthful. Think about the world of advertising. If you're an advertiser, nothing personal. But sometimes, you have to admit, sometimes advertisements aren't totally honest. You following me? So I'm going to show you an advertisement, an old-time advertisement, and you try, it's very subtle, it's very subtle, but try to figure out what maybe is not completely honest in this advertisement. It's about butter. Here we go. Take a look up here. Look at this advertisement. It's beautiful. Little guy has a block of butter on a fork there, looking good, and it says, butter is slippery. That's why we eat as much as possible to lubricate our arteries and veins. (laughs) Okay, it's subtle, but you might pick up that that's not totally the whole story, right? Butter's great, but probably not that much butter. Uh, How how about this? How how about an older cigarette ad? Watch this one here. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And then there's a picture of this lady, and it shows the T-zone, where where the goodness of the smoke going down your throat and and filling your... It's it's not telling the whole story, right? It's not surprising people wonder, is this true or not? Because we have things bombarding us that really aren't true. Now, I want to say, we serve donuts here at Shoreline. Those donuts are sweet, delicious, and they're full of sugar, and we're honest about it. We also have fresh fruit. Take your pick. But look at this little donut advertisement. It's emphasizing the wonder of all the vitamins in the donut. Um, Look at how happy those kids are. Pep and vigor. That's what, you know, maybe not completely honest. Now, there's a couple more, and I actually had asked uh, Jake, who does all of our graphics for us at the church here, to find me some fun things. So this is Jake's fine work. He has a good time digging things. So this digging things up for me. Here's a commercial that sh- I'm going to show you what's advertised, and then someone sent in a picture of what it really turned out to be. So this is, here's the first one. Some kids are outdoors. It's a warm, sunny day, and they're playing with the Aqua Blast hopscotch. Look at the size, the magnitude. Look at the water flow, knee-high water. Their kids are having the time of their lives. This family ordered it. It showed up, and they took a picture and sent it back to the company, and they said, well, here's what it, we actually got. Take a look at this. Either those children are 10 feet tall and they're giants, or something wasn't quite. And look at the water dribbling up about ankle high, right? It's like, well, and, and so... 
from a young age, we start wondering, should, should I trust? And then the last one was this. It was a microwavable, a microwavable spaghetti. Look at this. Now, look at this. Chili spaghetti. Now, that, that, you know, if you like chili and spaghetti and cheese, that looks pretty good. But somebody actually, see the bottom right corner, it says it's, micro, you know, it's microwavable. So somebody bought that. They microwaved it. I want you to see, when they took it out of the oven, pull the top off, what it actually looks like. Take a peek at this. Mmm. <laughs> Don't eat it all at once, okay? Um, you go, okay, make that go away. Please make that go away. Make it go away. Thank you. Uh, but isn't, isn't, there, isn't there a point where you start going, I'm a little suspicious. I don't know if I'm hearing the truth here. And I think we've become cynical. And there's lots of reasons why. So I did some personal study. I let Jake look, do, do the picture, you know, find fun pictures for me. But I did some study on the trust level of people believing the truth of different groups of people in our culture right now, in America specifically, since we're a church that resides here in, in America. We have people watching online in different parts of the world, hello, wherever you are around the world. But these are some studies that were done in America. Here's the first one, and it's asking the question, what is your trust level of the truthfulness of these different groups? So how about news people, the news and news people? Do you think in, over the years that the trust level of news anchors and the news has gone down a little bit? Do you have any suspicions about that? So here's, here's what, uh, Gallup, and Gallup's not like a Christian organization, Gallup did a poll in October of 2021, just two months ago, okay, this is current, about the trust level of the truthfulness of the news media. In your mind, I want you to answer this question, what percentage of Americans would say, I have a great deal of trust in the news media? What per- a great deal of trust. Here's what Gallup found out, 7%. Some of you are saying, that's high. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that's just because you're cynical. But you know, only 7% of Americans would say, I have a great deal of trust in the veracity and the truthfulness of the news media. Now, what percentage of Americans marked, my trust level is none at all? Okay, here's the answer. 34%. Five times more people say, I have no trust at all in the news media than those who say they have a high level of trust. Something, and if you go back to the 1960s, you know, 50s, 40s, that's different. But that's, that's where we're at right now. We just have to acknowledge that there's a, there is a, there's a problem with our view of what is true because there, there, and there's reasons for all these things, but the trust level has gone down. How about politicians? Okay? Politicians. There's a study that was done by the Pew Research Group, and it came out in May of 2021, so this is still this year. And they went back to the 1950s. And there's all kinds of data. I summarized, I kind of went through all, this, all, the, you know, all these different studies that were done, and they get averages. In the 1950s to mid-60s, the trust level of the truthfulness and trusting politicians was in the 70% range. 70% of people said, generally, I trust and think that politicians are speaking the truth. In the 1960s, it dropped down to 62 to 65%. In the 1970s, it dropped down to 50, down to even 35% in some of the studies that were done. In the 1980s, it plummeted, I mean, I mean, it climbed, spiked way back up to 40%. The 1990s dropped down to 20%. And then in the, in the, in the 20-teens, you know, 2015, 2017, 2019, some of those years, in the 20-teens, it was actually in the teens, 14, 15, 17%. So think about it. You know, less than one out of five Americans would say, I have a high level of trust in those who are supposed to be running our country. Does that, does that create an issue? I mean, does that, I mean, you think about it in a culture where, there's, where, where the trust about truth is going down and down and down. Um, I, I tried to find some studies on the trust of the medical and the scientific community. I think it's too early to see what's going to happen with all that. But I'll give you my prediction. That slope downward is continuing to grow. And here's what I wish would have happened. And I know, people, I know people in the scientific community and the medical community, and I love them and I trust them, but I'm saying in, in our culture right now, here's what I wish would have happened over the last two years. I wish that the scientific and the medical community people would have stood in front of a camera and said something like this. This is a crazy time, and we don't have any idea what's coming next. We will keep you informed. We're going to do the best we can. It's a moving target, but we just aren't totally sure. You know what that's called? That's called humility. It's called the truth. But people stand up and say, we know exactly what's going on, and this is it, 100%, believe us, and then six months later, it's something totally different, and people go, but wait, didn't you just... And, and there's an erosion of trust that people are being truthful with us. 
say, well, pastor, okay, now you've picked on the political people and the news people and the science people and the medical people. What about you pastors? Well, they do studies of that too, and it's not looking good. I'm being honest with you, okay? So uh, CT, Christianity Today, in 2018 was one, one I could find that seemed to have good data. 2018, uh, they said in 1985... 67% of Americans, now this is not churchgoers, it's just Americans in general. 1985, 67% of Americans would say we have a high, uh, the, a high honesty and ethical standards among pastors, among clergy. So 67%. By 2002, it was down to 52%. By 2018, it was down to 37%. Now I would hope that that number would be higher among Christians in church. That's Americans in general. But what I want you to see is this. The level of trust that people are being told the truth is dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And there's reasons for all of that. We're not going to get into all the reasons for it, but there's, I think there's reasons for all of that. And that makes us look and say, if we're followers of Jesus, what, what is the truth about? And what we know, if you're a follower of Jesus, is that Jesus said he is the truth. What we know is that truth doesn't change every five minutes or five months or five years. What is true is true because God says it's true, because God establishes those things. What we know is that truth isn't based on popular opinion or votes. And truth is not based on our emotional condition of what we think should be, but that God establishes the truth. And that's what we're going to think about together. When Jesus arrived, truth came into our world. And so here's the first arrival 2,000 years ago. The arrival, the incarnation, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when Jesus came to our world, heavenly truth came to demolish hellish lies. I worded that very specifically. Jesus came as heavenly truth to battle against the lies of the forces of hell and the enemy. Jesus came to bring truth so that we would be free and not bound up by the lies that are thrown at us from this world that come from the pit of hell. And there's a lot of lies that we have to look at and face. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to his followers. And he's teaching them. And he's instructing them. He's bringing them truth. So in John chapter 14, we begin in verse 1. We read these words. Jesus is speaking. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me, Jesus says. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Man, that's truth. Jesus prepares a place called heaven. He comes and brings us to be with him if we put our faith in him. And then Jesus says in verse four, you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas, who sometimes is called Doubting Thomas, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? How do we know how to get there? Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's declaring who he is. He's declaring the truth of heaven. He's declaring about the way to heaven is through faith in him. There's a lot of truth here. Jesus said, I am the truth. When he was born in a manger, the truth of heaven came to earth. And Jesus came to show us the way to live and to follow him. Now here's the challenge, the condition of our world in relationship to truth. The condition of our world is this. You will hear more people say, I believe my own truth. That's my truth. Then you'll hear say, I believe in the absolute truth of the word of God and of God. And what God, you, more people are prone to say, I heard a Christian the other day say to me, they were, I was talking to me and the person said, well, I have my own truth. I thought, well, that's nice that you can make up your own truth. The problem is, I don't trust me to make up my own truth. I don't trust, I know me too well to trust me to make up my own truth, which also means I don't trust you to make up my truth. I trust God to declare what the truth is. It's not my truth and your truth. There is truth. And God establishes what that truth is. And, but in our world right now, there's so much pushback. There's so much skepticism that people say, I don't, know, I don't want to believe in any absolute unchanging truth. I just want to kind of make up my own truth as I go. And the problem is that leads to bondage. That, that, that leads to false ways of thinking in every way possible. There are deep 
demonic ties to lies and deception. When lying is going on, when there's deception, Satan is at work. It's demonic. So why do you say that, Pastor? Well, John 8, 44, Jesus says that the enemy, Satan, is a liar and the father of lies. When, when Satan lies, he, the Bible says he speaks his native language. When there is lying, when there's deception, Satan is close at hand. In our hearts, in our lives, in our world. And there's lots of lies. There's lots of deception out there. We say, but I got to hold to the truth. In 2 Corinthians, if you're a note taker, you can write these down and go back and study these passages in greater detail later. But 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, Satan is called an angel of light. Why? Because he looks a certain way, looks good, but he's darkness and he's death. He's a deceiver. In Revelation 12, 9, we're told that Satan will be thrown down, that the great deceiver will be thrown down. He is a deceiver. He is a liar. He is the father of lies. When you see those lies going on, even though Jesus came with the truth, when lies are present, the enemy is at work. Man, be aware. Be tuned in. If somebody else is speaking the lie, if Colts are speaking the lie, or if you're even churning up your own version of things for yourself to kind of fit what you like or what you want, be careful. Because Jesus is the truth. He is the truth, which means there is no my truth for Christians. There's his truth. Here's the problem with my truth. It changes all the time. My truth when I was 15, before I was a Christian, was totally different than what I believe now. My, my truth 20 years ago, I didn't fully understand God's word. I, I, my truth doesn't change by how I'm feeling or what's going on in the world. It gets shaped every time I read this book to know what is true. And so that it's not my truth, it's God's truth. And here's the challenge in our world. There, there's two primary ways that people in our world try to establish what's true. One is by consensus or by vote. If we all agree that something's true, if we all vote on something, and that vote wins, then that's the new truth. No, truth doesn't change by our votes. Then every time one party or another party's in or out, well, now the truth has changed, the truth has changed. Or over time, the truth keeps changing. No, Jesus is the truth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So sometimes we say, well, it's by, if we vote on it, that becomes the truth. Here's the even more dangerous one. If we believe we establish truth by how we feel, by our emotions. Well, what is true is what feels right to me. And if I don't like the way it feels, then it can't be true. I experienced this when I first became a Christian, and I read this book for the first time. I read from Genesis to Revelation. I was a brand new Christian, but I, somebody, somebody told me this is God's word and I should read it, so I read it. And as I'm reading it, this theme came through that eternity is real and that every person will spend forever either in heaven, in the glory of God with God, or separate from God in a place called hell. Emotionally, as a 15-year-old, I liked the idea of heaven. Emotionally, guess what idea I didn't like? The idea of anybody going to hell. Didn't like that emotionally. Ah, so it can't be true because I don't like how it makes me feel. Do you understand that for many people, they, they change what God's word says or push things away because it doesn't make them feel good. We don't base our truth on common consent and a vote. We don't base our truth on how I feel about it. We base our truth on what is true, what Jesus revealed, what the word of God reveals, and we hold to that. And that actually sets us free and brings us hope. It really does. We understand what the word of God says. And so Jesus came, truth in a dark world. There were lots of lies in Jesus' day, and he came and fought against those lies, and he was bringing truth. But also, when we put our faith in Jesus, and you have to watch this now, his truth moves into you. When Jesus moves into you, he comes as the truth. So you now understand God in a new way, and you start growing in that truth. So here's the second arrival, and I call it inspiration. The inspiration of knowing that God is with us, and his truth resides in us and transforms us. Jesus is here with us and in us, and we know the truth, and he sets us free. Not it. We know the truth, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he sets us free. Listen to these words from John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. To the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. You're my followers. He said, hold to my teaching. You're my disciples. You're my followers. Listen to this. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, a lot of people think, well, if I follow what the Bible says, that's bondage, that limits me. No, no. The truth of God sets you free. You stand on something that's solid. It's not like, okay, what's, what's true this week? What's hot on Twitter? What's going on TikTok? You know, who's who's determining what's true and now? Well, that must be true. That must be true. That must, and it's like you just, 
It's dizzying. Try to follow me. It used to be that things in our world would change every year or two or three. Now it's like every three days. It's like, well, how do I know it's true? I mean, how do I know it's true? How do I know what to say, what I'm allowed to say, what I'm allowed to do? God's word and God's truth. We build our lives on it. You know what that does? <sighs> Sets us free. We know where we stand. Does everyone agree with us? No. But not everybody agreed with Jesus. They put him on a cross. But we know where we stand. We know what we believe. And his truth sets us free. And we do not have to believe the lies of the enemy. Here's the beauty of the word of God. And here's the beauty of the truth of God. You don't have to believe the lies of the enemy anymore. When he creeps up next to you and whispers in your ear and speaks lies, you don't have to believe it. Why? Because you speak the truth and you live in the truth. Let me tell you a common lie. The enemy will whisper to you, before you're, some of you are not believers yet, before you're a Christian, he'll whisper this, and even those that are Christians, he tries to bring this lie to us. Here's the lie. You are worthless and can't ever be made right. You're so broken, you're so mixed up, you're so worthless, you can't be made right. That's a lie from the pit of hell. But people hear it and they believe it. And God says, no, you are loved by me and of infinite worth. Do you know that that's the truth of Scripture? When the enemy whispers, you are worthless, you'll never be made right. The spirit of God comes and the word of God comes and says, oh no, no, no. Here's the truth. You are made in the image of God. Through sin, you're fallen and you're broken. But Jesus paid for your sins on the cross. He washes you clean. He loves you and he will embrace you and call you as his own. And he knew you in the depth of your sin, and he loved you so much that he died for you. If the infinite God was incarnate and came to this earth, and if the infinite God died for you to wash you clean, then you are of infinite worth to God. Deal with it. That's the truth. That's why it sets you free. Some of you are walking around believing the lie that you are worthless. And God says, you are so precious to me, I would give my only son of infinite worth, the infinite gift to wash you clean. That's the truth. Don't live in the lies. Let his truth set you free. The enemy will whisper to you, your sins are too great to be washed away. Okay, maybe God loves you, but he also knows all your messes and all you've done. And there's no way God could fully forgive you. One of my siblings, when I shared the gospel with her before she finally became a Christian, she actually said to me, I know that everyone who comes to Jesus, he forgives, but I'm afraid he's gonna tell me no. My sister told me that. I'm afraid he's gonna tell me no. Even though he's forgiven everybody else for their sins, she thought her sins were so big. That's a lie from the enemy. But Jesus says, my sacrifice is more than enough. That's the truth. That's why we have to go to this word. When when the enemy says, your sins are too big, you've messed up too much, God cannot forgive you, and Jesus says, my death on the cross paid for your sins, covered them all, I've counted the cost, I've paid it fully, it's finished, accept me. That's the truth. Deal with it. Just deal with it. And those days where you feel like, but but, but my, my sins, I see my sins, I see what I do. Yeah, so does God. That's why Jesus died for you. The truth is, if you place your faith in him, if you already have, or if you do one day, he will wash your sins away and take them as far as the east is from the west. That's the truth. That's why I hold to this book every day, every day. And that's why we should hold to this book. The enemy lies and whispers in your ear. You don't have anything to offer. You are so ordinary. That's a lie from the pit of hell. So God speaks and says, you are unique, you are gifted, and you are greatly needed. Do you recognize that when the enemy whispers in your ear, you have nothing to offer? You're not worth anything. You are just an ordinary, you're one person in this long line of human beings. You'll come and go, and you'll never be remembered. The enemy loves that kind of lie. And by the way, that's been kind of institutionalized in our educational system, telling people they're really nothing, they're they're just a product of random stuff, and their time will come in. That's a lie. What is the truth? That God knows you. God made you. He loves you. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you know what God does? Listen to this. When you put your faith in Jesus, all right, you receive Jesus. You receive his death on the cross. The Holy Spirit of God moves inside of you and gives you a gift or gifts to use for his glory. And there's things that God can do through you with the gifts he gives you that he will not do through anyone else in this world. 
You are that valued. You are that unique. You are that beautiful in the sight of God. And there's things he wants to do through you in this world. Man, you wake up in the morning knowing that. You walk in freedom and joy. That's why about every two months we do a class at Shoreline here called Spiritual Gifts. So we can figure, what is, it? what is the unique gift that God's given me? How can I use it for his glory? That class is happening today, right after the service, and online at 1 o'clock. Sherry, Sherry taught after the first service. She'll teach that class after the second service. She'll teach it at 1 o'clock online. So anyone in the church can say, I need to figure out how God's uniquely made me. How, and we'll, you'll do a gift survey, and you'll get the results of that today. And, and then if you want to meet with a pastor or with a leader in our church to talk about those gifts and how you can serve Jesus, we'll meet with you one-on-one. Why? Because we want to see God unleash the beautiful things the Spirit of God puts in you when you put your faith in Jesus. I'm a worthless nobody. I don't matter. And God says that's a lie from the pit of hell. You are precious. You are valuable. You are uniquely gifted. And I want to use you to bring me glory in this world. That's the truth. Deal with it. I mean, that's the truth about you. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe what the culture says. See, if you believe what the culture says about you, you will not feel valued. If you believe what you feel about you and your own emotions any given day, some of you would say, well, if my value is based on how I feel every day, I'll never feel good about me. Good thing your value is not based on how you feel about you or your emotions. It's based on what God says about you. Get the picture? I'll keep illustrating it until you get the point. No. Um, I'll give you one more. The culture will say, your value is based on your net worth, how much money you have, your skin color, the address where you live, the house you live in, or how you look in the world's eyes. Your beauty, how does this compare to magazine covers, and how does this compare? If that's your value, externals. And God says, no, your value is based on the fact that God calls you his beloved child. He says, you are my daughter, you are my son through faith in Jesus. That's your value. Deal with it. Don't believe the lies. Why do we have to hold to the truth of this word? Because this word tells us who we are and why we're on this planet and how we're supposed to live. And if we don't do this, we do it based on cultural votes or based on my own personal emotional feelings for the day. That's bondage. That's slavery. Walking in the ways of Jesus is freedom. And when the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So we battle the lies with Scripture. With, God, with God's you know, spirit-breathed truth. For all scriptures inspired by God. For, uh, Timothy tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired by God and it's profitable. It's to be used for reproving, for correcting, for training in righteousness. That, that God's people will be fully equipped for every good work. This book is, is given to show us who we are. So we battle against the lies with God's word. That's why pastors are constantly bugging you to read your Bible. And I know you get, I know the pastor's always saying, read my Bible, talk to God in prayer. Those are just basic things. It's life. But if you're going to battle the lies, you have to know the truth. So you keep going to the word. And we can walk in freedom as truth believers and truth speakers. We can actually walk in freedom, knowing the truth, letting it set us free, and then speaking the truth. And let me tell you, speaking the truth with gentleness and humility. I find that most people, when you push them and scream at them, they tend to push you back and scream back at you. I don't think that that's... The, G, Jesus disagreed with lots of people, including the religious leaders of his day. But, but, but for the most part, he was speaking truth, speaking truth. He disagreed with, with a woman caught in adultery. He, he disagreed with people living in sin. But he, he brought truth and grace, grace and truth together. And so we walk humbly into our lives, bringing in the truth with us. So, here's, so Jesus arrived when he came and truth came into our world. When you receive Jesus, if you haven't, when you do, if you have, when you did, truth comes into you. But then we walk into our world, walking and living in truth. So the arrival is this, the illustration. When we walk into any room, Jesus comes with us. With gentle humility, we live and share the truth. With gentle humility... We live and share the truth. And that's my encouragement to you, is that you would know the truth, it would set you free, that you would live that truth, and you would share that truth with others. If you have your Bibles, turn to 3 John. And in 3 John, 3 John is a little postcard in the Bible. If you turn an extra page, you will miss the entire book. The entire book of 3 John is this big in my Bible. It's right there on that one page. It's right between Jude and 2 John, right before the book of Revelation, but it's powerful. And I want to read verse, uh, verses 2, 3, and 4 to you. So John is writing to these, these Christians. And he says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. That's a great prayer. Even as your soul is getting along well. 
Now listen to this. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth. You're being faithful to. You're holding on to the truth. Telling how you continue to walk in it. Walk in what? Walk in the truth. And then look at verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my spiritual children, the people I poured into spiritually, you're wa- you don't just know the truth, you haven't just received the truth, you're walking in the truth. You're living in the truth. That's what God wants for us. Every, in, our, in our world, that's so upside down and so confused, where, where truth is changing moment by moment, the younger people in our world, they're being told what is true over and over. It keeps changing and changing and changing, and it's changing from wrong to wrong to wrong to wrong in most cases. So we walk into this world bearing the truth and living the truth and sharing the truth with humble hearts, with gentle spirits. So a question, what does it look like when we walk in the truth? What does it look like to actually walk in the truth of Jesus? And I would say the first thing it looks like is this, that we recognize what is true and what's a lie. That we recognize when something is true and when something's a lie. You see an advertisement for butter and how good it is to eat as much butter as you can for your veins and arteries, and you go, ding, 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 lie. Not true. That we recognize it. That you may be sitting in a class at school, in grade school or high school or college, and someone's teaching something, and it's completely the opposite of what you've learned in God's word and what you know is true. And they say, this is the truth, or this is the best truth we know for now, or this is my truth. And you go, ding, 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 and you don't do this out loud. In your mind, you go, liar! But if you're in class, you don't go, liar! Because that's going to probably be a problem. But, but, you know, but you look, you go, wait. And then you go home and you say to your folks, or if you're in college, you say to your roommates you know, who are Christians, you say, man, man, today the professor said this, the teacher said that. And it's just not true. And you recognize that there's, our truth is not based on what's the hottest new thing, what gets voted on, or what our emotions affirm. It's based on God's word. So the first step, if you're going to walk in the truth, is that you recognize when something is not true. And you just pause and you go, wait a minute, that's not true. It's called discernment. Discernment is actually recognizing, that's not right, that's not accurate. And you go back to the word of God and you talk with with, with Christians, you you say, wait a minute, I need to keep my head, I'm getting kind of yanked in different directions. But you recognize it. And you declare what is true and you reinforce in your heart what is true. And then you understand that we're guided by the truth of God's word. And I want to say this, I want to say just, and and there's, there's all kinds of topics we can talk about. But in every area of life, if you want to walk in the truth and you want a truth that's going to set you free, you walk in what this book says. And you follow it. So when when you go into a voting booth and you're going to vote, you say, okay, what does God's word say? More than my emotions, more than popular opinion, what will fulfill, have the best chance of fulfilling what God's word says? When it comes to forgiving people, and if you only forgive when you feel like it, you'll never forgive. But what does this book say about forgiving people who've wronged you? Oh, wait a minute. Wait, you're saying I have to align my life with the truth of God's word and not what I'm feeling? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's the freedom we find in Jesus. How do I handle my finances? This book talks about how we live with generosity, with humility. How do I view human sexuality and issues around gender? Lots to talk about that these days. God's word. But Pastor, you don't understand, everything's changed. No, it hasn't. There's no no challenges in culture that weren't around 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and 10 years ago. But things as they become, well, we voted on that now, now everything's changed. No, God's word. With humility, with gentleness, you hold to God's word, you live God's word out. When it comes to issues of life, what is life? How should life be valued? What does God say? Well, but that's not popular. That's not what the vote is. That's not how I feel. Those things aren't what decide what's true. It's what God declares is true. Issues of morality. What is moral? What is right? What is good? And so you just come back to God's word again and again and again. And I will tell you, I've been living this way for for now more than 40 years of my life and walking in the truth of God's word and it sets you free. You say, well, but what do you mean if it sets me free? Sometimes I might disagree with my culture then. And it might cost me something. Well, Jesus went to the cross. It does cost something to stand for Jesus. But it's freedom in that you actually know where you stand and what you believe. And you're not constantly trying to figure out, well, where, where are things going out? Where are the winds, when's the wind blowing out? How do I feel about it now? It stays the same. It's constant. And so 
Uh, you know, I, I was thinking about this and thinking about morality and sexuality. When Sherry and I were engaged, um, I will say I was very attracted to her. And if I would have said, I, wanted, I want to be um, physically intimate with my wife. I'm not going to get any more specific. But I say, I, I, I'm not married yet, but I want to be physically intimate with my wife. Well, I know the Word of God says the best way to live is to wait till you're married. But if I said, well, if I did a poll in culture, hey, culture, what do you think? Do you think I should wait to be physically intimate with my wife or should I do it now? If I just ask culture in general, what would culture say? Have fun. Enjoy. But I'm not looking to culture to define what's true. How about my own emotions? Well, I wasn't relying on those a whole lot at that point either because emotionally I was like, she's beautiful. I want to, you know, I, I, everything inside of me was like, well, and I, and, I, and I was actually, you know, going to seminary, planning on being a pastor, and I'm going, okay, well, I know Bible, the Word of God says that, but, you know, God knows that we're really married in our hearts. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to, you know what that's called? A lie. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going through all this stuff, right? So you know, what, you know how I handle it a lot of times? I just ran away. <laughs> Bye. And I leave. The world would have said fine. And my emotions would have said fine. But that's not what I base my life on. That's not what's ultimately true. It's God's word. And every part of who we are. So just because the popular vote says this or that, just because our emotions say that or this, we say I go with the word of God. So here's the last question. How do we speak the truth in a world that resists and even rejects the truth? How do we speak the truth? We, we live in a world that will, will resist and push against the truth or just says the truth isn't true or make up your own truth and the world doesn't want us to have, be, be, the world doesn't want us to have any sense of firm, unchanging truth. Why? Because then we can be manipulated all the time by whatever is popular or whatever we feel, but that's not what Christians do. That's not how we live. So we speak the truth to ourselves first. We speak the truth. If you want to walk in the truth, what does it mean to walk in the truth as a follower of Jesus? We speak the truth to ourselves. Boy, that decision I'm about to make isn't consistent with God's word. That decision I'm about to make is going to put me in bondage. We speak the truth to ourselves. Before you start telling all the world what the world ought to do, you check your heart and make sure that you are hearing from the Lord and you're responding. So when something in your life is out of line, when you're, the, the, if you're going to deceive others, the first person you have to deceive is yourself. Be careful of self-deception. Be careful when you're lying to yourself. All of us have to be careful. So speak the truth to yourself. But also, we speak the truth to those closest to us. You start by going to people that are in your family, good friends. And if you're concerned about something, if, something, if they're looking at the world the wrong way, you try to speak the truth gently and humbly, but you speak truth to those that are closest to you. I remember years ago, our boys are now 35, 33, and 32. Did I get that right? Right about in that ballpark? Right around there. Close. Okay, close. That's all I'm looking for. Um, our boys are all in their 30s. Good. Okay, good. Um, and so I'm not good with numbers. I'm a pastor. There's, you know, um, but, but one of our boys, when he was about nine, eight, nine, ten or so, and he had a real interest in money and numbers at that time. He was trying to figure out how you earn money and how money works, and he was just trying to figure all that stuff out. So he came up to me one day, and he says, Dad, I was thinking, if you and Mom didn't give away so much of our money, we could be rich. <laughs> Because we, we modeled to our boys giving to the church, and we would tell them, we were trying to teach them as kids to be generous, to live a generous life. So we talk about giving. So we said, you know, if you guys didn't give away so much, we could be rich, rich one day. And I want to speak the truth. I could have said to him, well, don't worry, none of it's your money anyways, but I didn't say that. Um, what I said to him was I said, I said, we are rich. We are rich. Now, at that time, we were probably in like lower middle class, like in American culture. But what I know is this. I said to, I said to him, listen, buddy, I said, in all the world, I said, if you have a place to live and a car to drive and breakfast, lunch, and dinner and two or three sets of clothes, just two or three sets of clothes, you're like in the top 15% of the world's wealthy already. And I looked at him and said, we have more than that. And he, I, said, I said, we are rich. That's the truth. See, you just, I didn't want him going through life looking and going, oh, well, they have more, so I guess we're poor. I wanted him saying, oh, wait a minute. In the scope of the whole world, we're very, very blessed. That's speaking the truth. So start speaking the truth to those that are close to you. And then we speak the truth in our cultural context. We were talking with people, and they share a perspective on things. And they, they say, well, this is what I think, or what about that? And I say, you know what? I actually don't see it that way. And we, and we speak the truth. As a pastor, I get to have these, these truth conversations. And I sit, uh, I, I sit around after services, sometimes until you know, the next service and after the next service, sometimes for half an hour, an hour, and just talk with people. 
And here's one of the conversations I've had through the years. I've had, um, and this is a tough one as a pastor. I've had women come to me and say, Pastor, um, I got pregnant. And it's not somebody who's going to have a relationship with me. It was a bad, it made a mistake. It wasn't a good choice, but I'm pregnant. And, and I, you know, I don't know what to do. What she's saying is I'm thinking about ending the life of my child. So that's the question she's asking. Boy, that's, not a, that, that's, a, deep, that's a deep moment, right? I've had this, this many, many times as a pastor. And you know what I do? I don't wag my finger. I don't shame her for getting pregnant. I say, can I talk to you about God's word? I take her to the truth. So I turn to Luke chapter 1. I've had this conversation many times with young women and older women. I go to Luke chapter 1 and I'll say, I say, do you, do you know the story about the first time that Jesus met John the Baptist? So well, what's that have to do with this? I said, well, let me tell you. I said, Mary was pregnant with Jesus and Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. And when they met each other, John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth said, blessed is the mother of my Lord. I said, the first time that Jesus and John the Baptist met, they were in their mother's wombs. And I'll just talk about that. And I'll say, you know, Jesus was, was Jesus in the womb, incarnate. And then I'll, then I'll turn to Psalm 139. And I'll say, you know, in Psalm 139, it talks about, it says, when you were in your mother's womb, God knew you. Matter of fact, he shaped and he fashioned you in your mother's womb. That God's hands, you know, I was, I'm saying God's hands are on the life of that little one, shaping that little one in your womb right now, that little boy or girl. Our firstborn son and his wife are pregnant with their third child, a little girl. So right now I have, if people say, how many grandkids do you have? I say, I have four. What's that? Oh, sorry, our third, our third, our, our youngest, yeah, our youngest son. Thank you, thank you. Our firstborn son has one. Um, our thirdborn son has three. Yeah, but well, no, three. Yeah. So we'll talk later about the math. <laughs> Sherry is a detailed person. I'm the general story person. But 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 if you say to me, Kevin, how many? You know, if you say how many grandkids do you have now? I say four. Zach and and Christine have little Kel, and Nate and Bryn have Cohen and Piper, and a little our fourth grandchild, in the womb. And I haven't seen that child yet, but that's my granddaughter. And so I'll, I'll sit and I'll talk with women who are at that moment, and I don't beat them over the head, and I don't try to shame them or guilt them, but I open the word of God, and I speak the truth about life. And I pray for them. And I know I can't force them to do anything, but I try to speak as clearly and as truthfully as I can. And, and, and then, down the line, they'll often come back to me. Sometimes I'll come back with a little baby in their arms. And I'll say, I want you to meet my little girl or my little boy. And we pray. I pray for God's blessing on that little one. And sometimes they come back. And I can see on their face that the shame and the lies of the enemy are already attacking their soul. And, and they say, I think I might have made the wrong decision or I'm already feeling bad and guilty. And then as a pastor, I don't beat him up then either. I'll put my arm around him and I'll say, can I pray for you? And I'll lift him before the Lord and pray that the lies of the enemy won't destroy their soul and pray they'll make better choices and you bless them and you love them because we're Christians. And that's what we do. You speak the truth and then you speak the truth. The truth hasn't changed before or after the decision. And grace remains in both of those. And we live in a world that's telling us there is no truth. And Jesus came as the truth and says, I am the truth and I will set you free. To walk outside of the truth of God is to walk in bondage. And to walk in the truth of Jesus is to walk in freedom. And that's what he wants for you and that's what he wants for me. On that first Christmas, truth came into our world. When you receive Jesus, truth moves into you. And when you walk into the world, his truth goes with you. 
with gentleness, with grace, but with unbending conviction. Hold to the truth of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, this is our prayer. In this confused and broken world, may we be people of truth. May we not decide that what is true is what is popular or what is voted on or what is culturally acceptable. Lord, may we not bounce around with what we think is true based on how we feel and our emotions because, Lord, our emotions go all over the place. But may we build our lives on the truth of you, Jesus, and the truth of your word. And then may we, with gentleness and grace, but strength and conviction, stand on that truth and share it with others, that they would be captured by your truth and come to find freedom in you. Jesus, thank you for loving us right where we are, but never leaving us there. Thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And for each one here who's received you, I thank you that you have gone ahead of them to prepare a place. And for those who have not yet received you, may they hear the truth of your gospel this Christmas season and cry out to you knowing, God, that you save through faith in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Before I ask you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to invite you, if you want prayer for a joy or a sorrow or a struggle, maybe you made a decision in the past and you're going, man, I made a wrong decision and you want to just pray for God's grace and power and freedom from the lies of the enemy, come forward. If you're anywhere on campus, come forward here in the worship center. We'd love to pray with you. We have teams on both sides here that are ready to pray with you. If you're at home, you can call the number there and there's somebody ready to pray with you or email the, the email address and we'll put that on our prayer list and we will faithfully pray for you over the next couple of weeks. If you're new at Shoreline today, if you're online and you're new, just text the word welcome to the phone number you see right there. Real quick, just text welcome. Please do that. We want to get back a hold of you and try to connect with you and give you a warm personal welcome, our best personal online welcome we can give you. And if you're on campus anywhere, family worship venue, courtyard, worship center, and you're new, take a moment before you leave. Go right by the Connection Center in the, in the lobby here, and they want to give you a little gift. They want to thank you for coming. They want to answer your questions and just give you a warm welcome to Shoreline Church. The spiritual gifts class, if you want to know the unique way that God has gifted you and how to develop that gift and discover that gift, uh, Sherry's right now up these stairs uh, in the garden room right there. You can go any way, but you've got to get right to that corner upstairs of the building, and we'll guide you there and join her for that class. And if you're online at 1 o'clock, she'll be doing that class again electronically. She'd love to have you join her online. Christmas Eve services. This coming Friday is Christmas Eve. If you come at 9, 11 in the morning, we won't be here. Uh, it's at 2.30 and 4 o'clock. Be with us. Join us online. Join us on campus. Invite a friend to join you online. Invite a friend to join you on campus. And let's celebrate Jesus together uh, this coming Friday. And then Saturday is Christmas. Sunday on the 26th, we will have a special worship service all online. If you show up, you'll be here alone because we won't be here. I will bring the message. It'll be a message from my living room. The, the prayer will be Pastor Sean from his living room. The closing uh, thoughts will be from Pastor Brandon from his living room. And the worship music will be from Cole and the team in his living room. So stay in your living room. Get online at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Join us for online on the 26th. And then the first kickoff of the new year, back on campus. All right, so be sure you're here for that. And finally, if you didn't get the, the E version of my letter and kind of short little annual report, we've got hard copies in the Connection Center. Pick one of those up. I'll just give you a sense of how the year's gone and give you a picture of things. It'd be great if you pick that up and then pray for us as we go into a new year. If you're able to stand on home, online, in the worship center, let's stand together as we close. Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And when you follow him, he brings freedom, deep and abiding freedom. So as you go from this place, walk in the presence and the truth of Jesus, who is the truth. Live the truth, and with grace and humility, but unbending conviction, share the truth of God wherever you go. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you on Friday night, Christmas Eve. God bless you.